Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship here at St. Mark's on this third Sunday of Lent. I'm very glad to welcome all of you, and that's especially true if you're here for the first time this morning. <clears throat> if that's the case, then I hope you'll visit our website and drop us a quick note there so that we can welcome you more fully into the life of St. Mark's if you would like for us to do that. We'd love to be in touch with you. Just an announcement that our Lenten offerings continue the uh, chance on Wednesdays to come in and pray for a few moments of quiet meditation here at the church from 10 until 12. Uh, our way of love, excuse me, uh, Lenten study on Sunday evenings from 4.30 to 5.30. And our next Lenten quiet day um, continuing our encounter with the Gospel of Mark is Saturday the 13th. So please know that we would love to have as many of you as possible join us on that day. And now let's worship. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing set steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. 
You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 19 responsively by full verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One, one day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of the head. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. A reading from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us our being saved is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish of the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified and stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is powerful power of God and the wisdom of God. For those foolishness, this is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This morning finds us halfway through Lent, halfway through our journey toward Holy Week and Easter, through our season of self-examination and reflection. The season meant to help us welcome our risen Lord with more depth, more fullness, more joy. So how are we doing? And what can our scripture readings offer to us by way of helpful lenses and fresh ways to think, and especially fresh ways to be? The story we hear from John this morning is a familiar one to many of us, in part because it's found in all four gospels. Each of the four evangelists find it an important story to tell. The basic outlines of the story are the same in each one. Jesus is in the temple and he gets fired up with enough zeal that he begins tossing tables and driving out sellers and animals. But the message being delivered through the telling of the story is not the same in John's gospel as in the others. The first clue we get comes in noticing where in John's gospel the story occurs. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it comes near the end of Jesus's life, in his final week, comes as the conflict between Jesus and the religio-political authorities is hurtling toward its inevitable climax. In those gospels, it serves as the action which finally leads to Jesus being arrested and eventually being hauled off to his execution. This Jesus has threatened the religious and political systems that find their most clear manifestation in the activities of the temple. And for him to threaten those power systems, to call their existence into question, and to say they go against everything God wants for and from his people and for the world, is to bring down their power on his head, or at least their supposed power, Because what the resurrection will prove just three short days later is that they have no real power, that it is God's word that will have the last say, not theirs. But in John's gospel, there's something different going on. Conflict, for sure. Differing perspectives about the world, about God, and what makes for a holy life, sure. But what Jesus is saying about the temple in John is not simply or even primarily that its practices have become corrupt, that they've begun to exploit the poor and enrich those already in power. It's that the temple itself is no longer needed at all. That in the person of Jesus, the reason for the temple no longer exists, at least in one significant way. John places this story near the very beginning of Jesus's three years of ministry. He's done the first of his signs, 
the first of his actions that ask listeners then and now to look deeper, to ask themselves what this sign of his means, what it says about who he is. Each sign holds up a different facet of who he is and what trusting in him or believing in him, as John usually puts it, what it means for their daily lives, what it tells them about God, about who they should be, and about how they should, they should be as they begin to answer that question for themselves. His first sign at the wedding in Cana, where he turned water into fine wine, was meant to show them that God was about joy and abundance and celebration of human love. And now in the temple, he's showing them something utterly remarkable, that he himself in his bodily person is the locus of God, is the place where God can be found. If you're looking for God, he's wanting to say, then you don't have to look for a building. You don't have to look for a specific physical place. You just have to look for me. He's reframing the whole perspective on where God can be discovered, where God can be encountered. It's what will inform his interaction with the Samaritan woman in just a few short chapters. Where should believers worship? She'll ask him. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. The answer Jesus gives is not what she expects not the way she has framed the question as an either or decision. Ma'am, he says, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And in his interaction in the temple, he puts it this way, in response to a request from the Jewish leaders to give them a sign to explain his passionate and disruptive action. In other words, to answer, just where do you get off doing such a thing, buddy? And here's what he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Absurd, they say. It's taken 46 years already to build this temple and it's still not complete. Yet you'll bring in a crew and build it back again in three days? They're missing what he's meaning, of course, as others so often do in the Gospel of John. They're hearing on a surface, literal level, but he's speaking from a deeper, more multi-layered level. As the evangelist John puts it, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And this points to another interpretive lens that's important when listening to John. The final deepest understanding of who Jesus is comes only after his death, resurrection, and ascension. It's only then that you can see fully the meaning of his coming, of his words, of the things he speaks through his actions. After the resurrection, John tells us here, the disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, which for John is always the point. So what does all this mean for us? At our midway point in Lent, what questions might this raise? For one, it asks us to look again at where we assume God is to be found, most easily accessed. Is it in our building? Or is Jesus pointing us to something larger, broader? In this year when we've been forced by a virus to be away from our building, this question might be more salient than it's ever been. Our present moment opening up, uh, us up to another layer of truth if we're game to search for the answer. What is the purpose of our building? What's the most important thing we do here? And if Jesus is the locus of where God is to be found, Jesus, a fully human being, an embodied self, what does that mean about how we see our own bodies? 
the church has so often taught people to be ashamed of their bodies, to scourge them, to demean them. But if we listen to what Jesus is saying here, then bodies, human bodies, are where God can be found. If you saw your body, your physical self, as a place where God resides, what would that mean? What might change? How would you see yourself? How would you understand God? We Anglicans love to say that we have a particular charism in our emphasis on the incarnation, and we do. We believe that God is made present to us in stuff, the material things of this world, bread, water, wine, oil. That's one reason why this very disembodied year has been so painful for us. It's why we long to be back in each other's physical presence. But I wonder if our focus, our emphasis on incarnation doesn't falter somewhat when we get to our own bodies. If we don't fail to comprehend the fullness of what Jesus is saying here, your body, my body, is a place where God can be found, where God is found, whether we recognize it or not. What would it mean to reflect on that question for the rest of this Lent? And here's another corollary to this fact of our bodies being the locus of God's presence. If we really believe that, then what does it mean when we see other human bodies being worn down, abused, sick, isolated? What does it mean when some of us have to work two or three jobs simply to put food on the table, while others of us have the luxury of free time? If I believe that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul puts it, then how can I let a world stand where the bodies of others are harmed by poverty, by war, by the systemic racism that this pandemic has functioned to help us see more clearly? What would it mean to see our bodies and all human bodies as thin places, as the Celts put it, they mean by that phrase, a place where the veil between heaven and earth is especially thin, where we can feel and see truths that elude ourselves in our everyday lives. Often they are places of great natural beauty. But if we absorb the reality of what Jesus is saying here, can we begin to see, our, see bodies, our own and others, as thin places? as revelatory places, locations to look more closely, to delve more deeply as we seek to find God. And here's another truth. If God's presence is embodied, then it's with our bodies and through our bodies that God can go to work. In fact, that is the only means by which God can truly go to work because theoretical or intellectual approaches to God are never where true human need is found. If I am suffering, what I want is another human being who will be present with me. Don't give me some rational answer about where God is in the midst of my suffering. Give me yourself. Put yourself on the line. Or say it this way, if you love me, do what Jesus did. Give me yourself. This is hard to understand and even harder to live. And that's one reason we embodied human beings are called by God in to live in community in the presence of other bodies because we can't do this on our own. We need each other together to remind ourselves of this deep truth. We need a community in which to practice giving ourselves away, a community in which we can find courage to do difficult things that we'd be scared to do alone. In short, we need each other, which is sometimes scary to admit. So ask these questions as you continue your journey through Lent, my friends. Ask your own variations on them. Consider what it means to give yourself your embodied entire self to God and to the world God loves. 
and wants to love through you. It's in and through your body, in the fullness of your being, that God will answer and call you forward. It's Easter that's coming and the resurrection from the dead, bringing new life to you and to the world. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Loving and wise God, you have given us guidance to create societies of faithfulness and justice. Cleanse your people and drive far away from us all greed and exploitation, that we may be willing servants in your work of healing and reconciliation as we pray. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. O gracious one, your testimony is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. Enlighten your church with such zeal for your house that we may honor your name and liberate your people. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Infinite one, your judgments are true and righteous altogether. Let the message of the cross destroy the wisdom of the wise and thwart the discernment of the discerning, that the nations of the world may abandon their idolatries of power and wealth in order to participate in your divine justice and compassion. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Loving one, the firmament shows your handiwork. Look upon your world and inspire all nations and societies to follow your commandments, to live justly and honestly with one another, and to offer compassionate relief to all in any need or under any threat. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Merciful one, your commandment is clear and gives light to the eyes. Free this community from our addictions and idols and cleanse us from our unwitting sins, our secret faults and our presumptions, that we may be whole and sound and innocent of great offense. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Compassionate one, following your will is more to be desired than much fine gold. Let your healing grace be with those for whom we pray, especially the heavens declare your glory, our creator, and we bring to you our grateful praise and thanksgiving 
especially for Through the crucified one, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, you raise all who have died into your eternal light. We remember especially before you Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Bless and consecrate this day of rest and prayer as we bring our intercessions to you, O Holy One, that we may continue Christ's work to overturn all forms of exploitation and injustice and lead your people out of the house of slavery into the house of love where your spirit reigns in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And now join me in praying for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants in the journey of their lives. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now walk in love as Christ loved us. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Look mercifully on this your family, almighty God, that by your great goodness they may be governed and preserved evermore. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth to bless and serve God's world. Thanks be to God.